So if I say if I say multiple high places, what does that mean? Many. Okay. And if I say a central high place, what does that mean? Center. Okay. Center. Okay, yeah, it means center, but come on, let me go back again. If I say multiple high places, one of y'all said it, what does that mean? Many. Many. Okay. And if I say a central high place, what does that mean? The main high place. Ahad. 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 Okay. Ahad. One. One. So I want you all to get this, because as this lesson unfolds in 12, I pray that things that you have been experiencing, that Israel is doing, comes a little bit more to light as we talk about it. Take us into chapter 12, Ekaziel. The central high place. Cain, and it reads on this wise, These are the statutes and the judgments which you shall be careful to observe in Haaretz, in the land in which Yahweh El of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on Haaretz, the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the Goyim, the nations, the heathen, the Goyim, which you shall dis dispossess, serve their Elohim. On the high mountains and on the high and on the hills and under every green tree, and you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their Elohim and destroy their name from that place. You shall not worship. You shall not worship the. You shall not worship. Yahweh Elohecha with such things. But you shall seek the place where Yahweh Elohecha chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before Yahweh Elohecha. And you shall rejoice in all which you have put your hand and put your hand, you and your household, in which Yahweh Elohecha has blessed you. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is in his right own eyes, for as you for as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which Yahweh Elohecha is giving you. But when you cross over the Yarden and dwell in the land which Yahweh Elohecha is giving you to inherit, and he gives you the rest from all your and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be the place. Then there will be the place where Yahweh Elohecha chooses to make his name abide. Therefore there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifice, your tithe, the heath offerings of your hand, and all the choice offerings which you vow to Yahweh. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh Elohecha, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites, the, Le the Levites who are within your gates, since he has no portion nor inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place where Yahweh chooses, in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. However, you may slaughter and eat meat within all your gates, whatever your heart desires, according to the blessing of Yahweh Elohecha, which he has given you, the unclean and the clean may eat of it, of the gazelle and the deer alike. Only you shall not eat the blood. You shall pour it out on the earth like water. You may not eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or your new wine or oil or the firstborn of your herd or flock or of the any of your offerings which you vow, of your free will offerings or of the heave offerings of your hand. But you must eat them before Yahweh Elohecha in the place which Yahweh 
El Helcha chooses you and your sons and your daughters, your male servants and your female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh El Helcha in all which you have put your hands. Take heed to yourselves that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in your land. When Yahweh El Helcha enlarges your borders as he has promised you, and you say, let me eat meat, because you long to eat meat, and you may eat as much as meat as your heart desires. If the place where Yahweh El Helcha chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter from your herd and from your flock which Yahweh has given you, just as I have commanded you, and you may eat within your gates as much as your heart desires. Just as the gazelle and the deer have, are eaten, so you may eat them. The unclean and clean alike may eat them. Only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life. Only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life. You may eat the life with the meat. You shall not eat it. You shall pour it out on the earth like water. You shall not eat it, that it may go well with you and your children after you when you, have, when you do what is right in the sight of Yahweh. Only the holy things which you have and Shlika, only the holy things which you have and your vowed offerings you shall take and go to the place which Yahweh chooses. And you shall offer your burnt offerings, the meat, and the blood on the altar of Yahweh El Helka. And the blood of your sacrifice shall be poured on the altar of Yahweh, and you shall eat the meat. Observe and obey all the words which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever. When you do what is good and right in the sight of Yahweh El Helka, when Yahweh El Helka cuts off from before you, the Goyim, the heathen, which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them hmm. after they are destroyed and before you, and you do not inquire after their Elohim, saying, how did these nations serve these Elohim? And I also, likewise, you shall not worship Yahweh El Helcha in that way, for every abomination to Yahweh, which he hates, they have done to their Elohim, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their Elohim. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the reading of Deuteronomy 12, verse 1 through 32. I pray that Yahweh add clarity, enlightenment, and edification to the reading of his word. So we're dealing with the Torah, the law, the instruction that deals with the central sanctuary. And we are instructed that we are not to do things as we were doing them then, when we had not entered the land, we were outside the land, that everybody is doing things according to their own way or doing things the way they see fit. Okay, so now what was Israel doing? We were making sacrifices, right? And we were being instructed in the future tense sense of where we to bring our offerings and our sacrifices. We were to bring them to Ehad, one central place. And we were to present ourselves at this one, especially the men, at this one central place three times in a year, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of the Tabernacles at the end of the year. That's citing from Exodus chapter 23, verse 14 through 17, in the book of Exodus chapter 34, in the latter parts of the scripture, around verse, I believe it's uh, 18 through 23. And so we go up to this, this high place. Now, if you look at verse 13 and 14, it says, Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place you see. Your offerings. This is any place you see. But 
continuation of the previous thought. But in the place which Yahweh chooses, in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do as I command. Stop. Let's look at the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse, four, uh, verse 24. Because we're going to get a historical uh, impetus. That's the word I want to use. The historical impetus behind where this central place was. Did the creator choose to put his name everywhere in Israel as a high place? Then everybody can go and sacrifice and make their offerings whenever they want to and any time they want to? Or was there a specific order? I'm not talking about your personal walk with Abba. I'm talking about us nationalistically speaking. And this is where we begin to take the steps in the learning process of moving beyond our individualism, beyond the campism, beyond the communityism into nationhood is where the focus has to be if we are becoming a mature people. We have to have a centralized government. We have to have a central place of worship. We have to centralize, not scatterize. We understand that the captivity keeps us scattered. And the more these brothers get up and talk and talk and talk, and they don't really talk or work on unity the way we should be, the leadership keeps us scattered. Leadership that's sent from on high will bring us together, not scatter us. Right. Specialism. I'm, I'm working on trying to impress upon you centralization. Hmm, centralism. Okay. Oh, look, man, even the heathen understand that. Here it is, the state of Illinois, 18 million people in this state, they have a central government, although they have little municipalities. And they have the big old city of Chicago. The state leadership assembles in Springfield. Springfield is the high place of the state. That's the centralized government. The centralized government of all 50 states of the United States of America, I'm not talking about just the corporation. I'm talking about the organic. When it was organic, when it was an organic country, they met first in New York. They moved the high place from New York to Philadelphia. They moved the high place from Philadelphia to Washington. Then when it became a corporation in 1871, they centralized it and they kept it in Washington and then they gave it a name D.C. for District of Columbia. But it was still centralized. If the heathen does something in unrighteousness, they understand that principle. How much more will the sons and daughters of righteousness understand the principle? Yahweh I taught, a nation divided against itself cannot stand. You've got to centralize. You've got to grow up. You've got to begin to trust one another. And all of that is based out of love. Exodus 20, 24. Abba gives us instructions. This is what he said. He said, An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings, your peace offerings, your sheep, your oxen, in every place where I record my name. I will come to you, and I will bless you. Now let's get this simple understanding. He does not, will not show up if his name is not there. His spirit of holiness does not show up if the group, if the organization does not use his name. That's what the book says. Every place my name is recorded, that's what it says. We can disagree and disagree with me if you want to. Go right ahead. I'm telling you what it says in the book. The book says, in every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. Okay, let's go a little bit further. It says in the notes, see Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5. Deuteronomy 12, 5 says, but you shall seek the place where Yahweh Elohim 
chooses to put or chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. Okay, mark that. Turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 78, verse 67 through verse 69. What does that say, <laughs> Yekaziel? 78, 67, 68, and 69. And it reads on this wise. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Yosef and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Yehawadah, Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he has established forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so he built the place that Yah chose to put his name at was in Mount Zion, in Yerushalayim, in the tribe of Yahawada. First Kings, sixth chapter, verse one, and it says all the way to verse thirty-eight. Now there's a lot of chapters, well, that's a lot of verses to read. We're gonna we're gonna hone in on the specific point. First Kings six. The central sanctuary is what we're getting, the central place of worship, right? Centralization. You know, if Israel not careful, Israel can become like the church. I said if Israel is not careful, Yasharala can become like the very churches that many in Israel left. Because I was never in the church. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. And what I mean by that is... The congregationalisms of the church are divisive against our people okay. because you've got one Negro minister on this end of the corner of the church and one Negro minister over here on that end of the block and another one here, four or five churches on one block, all that religion and no righteousness. Hallelujah. Israel can become very similar to that if, if it's not careful. We call that campism. Camps can pop up all over the place, and if we're not teaching righteousness, but we're teaching campism, campism is just another term for denomination, which is really demon nomination. That's what that is. Hallelujah. All right? So you got to be careful. So what I'm saying is that whoever it is is teaching is not teaching a centralization of Israel coming together, returning back to the land. And establishing, Yahweh establishing his kingdom rule under Hamashiach with Jerusalem as the capital city and Mount Zion as the high place, then something is wrong. If anybody is teaching you to stay here, leave that place yesterday. All right? Hallelujah. All right? I'm just being honest with you. If anybody teaching you that their camp is the only place that has the truth, you need to leave there yesterday, too. Okay. All right? No one community, including ours, I said this once, I said it twice, and I will reiterate it because it's the truth. No one group, one community, one camp in Israel has all the truth. Y'all scattered us. Therefore, if you're teaching truth, the truth would be in increments among everybody. And then if everybody begins to grow up and come into the knowledge of Yahweh and Yahweh's child, then you can bring Israel together under one Yah and one Messiah. But you cannot bring Israel together with all of the leadership. Everybody got the Messiah complex because every last one of them think without saying they the Messiah. See, that's the truth. Hey. The folk don't want to tell you. That that's why they act in a prideful way, because they don't really recognize that this people don't belong to you, and it don't belong to me. It belongs to Yahweh, and Yahweh shot paid the price. For every last one of us, he spilled his precious blood. So you've been bought with a price. 
You don't owe me nothing but the right to be respectful and hear what I'm saying in truth. And when I stop, if I should ever stop teaching the truth, then turn me off and listen to somebody else. I'm going to tell you the truth regardless of the cost. Biggest problem in Israel is ego. Ego is the biggest problem in Israel because the brothers won't humble themselves to work together to save a nation. But when they come for our necks and our backsides, then you're going to find out who is true in Israel and sincere to the Creator and who has not and who has been all out for their filthy lucre and ill-gotten gain. When you talk about the Negro ministers, you're talking about Israel. You just don't know that they Israel. And when you talk about brothers who are in the campism, you're talking about Israel who do know Israel. You got to teach this truth about what is right and what is wrong in the eyes of the Almighty. He does not like the separateness among us. Don't be making the excuses about the captivity and the curses. Tell the truth. The truth of what broke us up is that you had two brothers squabbling, Yeraboom and Rehoboom, and the young men went with the young brother who, out of egoism, thought they could lead. And the other one, because of what the sins of his father Solomon did, put us into the condition that we are in. Brothers fighting and bickering among one another. That's been going on since 922 B.C. That ain't nothing mm -hmm. new, but it ain't right. We got the tools to fix that, folk don't simply like me because two reasons. Number one, I tell them the truth. And number two, I say we have got to come together. And I don't come together under nobody's doctrinalism. Doctrine is killing us. Doctrine of camps is killing and separating us. Aren't you all tired of just going from this camp to that camp and this place? We, you know what we need to be? We all need to be home. And you know where we yeah. all need to assemble? We all need to assemble in Jerusalem. And when we assemble yeah. in Jerusalem, everybody come up. Everybody ain't going to be stranded over the silo. You're not going over to Shechem. Them days of worshiping and all them other different places are over with. Don't you understand that that's the same thing going on? Yeah, we got to do and worship and assemble online and at the various different places where we are scattered. But you don't keep doing that, talking about not going to the land if you really understand this book. If you really yeah. understand this book, the book says, Up, Zion, flee out of the midst of the daughter of Babylon. Yeah. Every man and woman save his life. The book don't yeah. tell you to stay here. The book tell you to get up out of here. The book don't tell you to have sons and daughters in the land of your captivity. Oh, yes, it does, Prince. Oh, yeah, it do. If you read the book of Jeremiah, right, that was for the days of Babylon. You done had sons here. You done had daughters here. You're going to keep perpetuating your offspring in captivity? Why are you so cowardice to have your children in your own land? To create a generation that's free in your own land? you offspring and birthing babies in captivity. Come on. Don't you know that keeps the people's mind captive and you keep perpetuating the same old story over and over and over and over again? Well, you know, in Babylon, and you never get to tell the story, yeah, I saw my son, I saw my daughter, my grandbabies grow up in Israel. Hmm. You'd rather oh, say, yeah, you know, on 122nd and such and such, we was teaching. What? Yeah, yeah, over on Madison and Mayfield, we was teaching. What? Don't you know it brings greater joy and glory to the Creator to say, Yah brought us up out of the captivity of the great captivity and reestablished us in Israel. And look at my granddaughters and grandchildren and third and fourth generations. And what? They all born in the land? Yeah. We got up and left in 2019, and we've been here now for hundreds of years. So who's going to write that God. story? Your Come prophets on. wrote about the days of Babylon. They wrote about the days of Assyria. They wrote about the days of Greece. Who is writing today what's happening to us where there is a record when we get up out of here so somebody can rehearse it in the hearing of the children to come? Hallelujah. Y'all hear what I'm saying to you? Come on. You got to lay this to heart. There's a one central sanctuary. You got to go up to Zion. You've got to go up to Israel. You've got to go up to Jerusalem. Why? 
Well, I said to you again, if you go into the wedding supper of the Lamb, it's not here. If you think Yahweh Shai's wedding supper is going to be here in hell, you going to miss the wedding. I'm just telling you, this will be another, this will be another wedding you miss. Come on. Huh? Hey. So hey. You're going to miss it. Now, and now you, perhaps you didn't get invited is why you miss it. That's another reason. But if you got the invitation, you say, well, what invitation? The invitation is in the book, beloved. It tells you that the bride is Israel. It tells you the bridegroom is Hamashiach. It tells you that the wedding supper is on Mount Zion, which is in Israel. So we know where you're supposed to be, what mountain you're supposed to be on, and who the bride and the bridegroom is. And I said to you before, and I said again, when have you ever gone to a wedding and not know the bride, the bridegroom, where it's being held at, what place to go, and what time to be there? Hallelujah. All right? So we're preparing Israel for the wedding supper. We're preparing Israel for the high holy days and the feast to keep them in the holy land. We're going up for sacred visitation so you can keep the feast in the Holy Land. Not just keep it over here. Keeping it over here is good, but it ain't nothing like keeping the feast in that land. And don't make no excuses about the land is defiled and the heathen is there. Look, this land is defiled and the heathen is here also. Now what's your excuse? Huh? Stop making excuses. Keep making excuses. Oh, you can't. For every scripture you got that's negative, I got a thousand that's positive. It all depends on how you're going to teach the book. And teaching in truth is what we're saying to teach it to you. Teach it. <laughs> teaching in truth. Your cousin asked me this question, and I'm going to cover this real quick. He said, why keep the commandments, Brother Prince? Revelation 22:14. And we talked about this earlier, but I want to read this to you real quick because he brought up an interesting point. And I didn't cover it because we were into the midst of the dialogue. In 22.14 of Revelation, if someone asks you what is the reason you should keep the commandments, it reads this way. 22.14, it says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter through the gates into the city. Now, the city is the New Jerusalem. It's got 12 gates. And the name of the 12 that's on the gates are the 12 tribes of Israel. Ain't no heathen name among them. Ain't no Gentile name among them. Your city, Yah's kingdom, restoration of Israel to the promised land. The kingdom does not come down in America. The kingdom comes down in Israel. The reestablishment of your government is in Israel. The return of you from the land of the captivity, which we're going to go into it, the latter point of this, is from wherever you are to Israel, the restoration of Israel to the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 13. And it reads on this wise, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other Elohim, mm. which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh Eloheka is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh Eloheka with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after Yahweh Eloheka and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from Yahweh Eloheka, who brought you out of the land of Misraim and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which Yahweh Eloheka has commanded you to walk. So you shall put away that evil from your midst. If your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom or your friend who is 
as your own soul secretly entices you, saying, Let us go serve other Elohim, which you have not known, neither your fathers have known, or the Elohim of the people which are all around you, near to you or far from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall you, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him. Mm. You shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies. Because he sought to entice you away from Yahweh, Elohecha, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of bondage. So all of Israel shall hear and fear, and not again do such wickedness as among you. If you hear someone in one of your cities, which Yahweh, Elohecha, gives you to dwell, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other Elohim, which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it and all that is in it and its livestock with the edge of the sword. Shlika, its livestock also with the edge of the sword. And you shall gather all its plunder into the middle of the street and completely burn it with fire, the city and all of its plunder, for Yahweh Elohecha. And it shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand that the that Yahweh may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you and multiply you just as he swore to your fathers because you have listened to the voice of Yahweh Elohecha to keep all his commandments which I command you today to do right in the eyes of Yahweh Elohecha. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Rabbi. And that is the reading of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, verse 1, through the end of the chapter, which I believe is verse 18. May Yahweh add clarity, enlightenment, and edification to the reading of his word. So a false prophet comes along and he gives you a sign. He parts the clouds. He gives you a sign. A light comes on. Or he gives you a sign and tells you something's going to happen. And it happens. And in the interim of doing that, which is forthcoming, because you as an Israelite want a sign, because Scripture says that Yahudim seeketh after a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So you want a sign, and they give you this sign. But then in the interim of giving you the sign, they tell you, go after Allah. Go after Zeus. Go after Jesus. Go after Asar, Aset, Heru, come on, become an Egyptologist. Why don't you go on and get off into Islam? You girl, you know you need to leave that Israelite thing alone, go back, come back into Christianity. Okay? Anybody that tries to take you away from the path of light that the Creator has put you on and bring you back into the world to serve, remember this now, this is part of the Deuteronomy curse, that will cast you into a land that you do not know of, you nor your fathers, and there you will serve other gods that you nor your fathers knew not of, gods of wood and gods of stone. So in the land of the enslavement, in the land of the captivity, while we're in the diaspora, under exile, we would have forced God ideologies imposed upon us, forced upon us, belief systems of others forced upon us. Now you've come into the knowledge of who you are and somebody comes to you and gives you some type of vision or some type of sign and then in the interim, I'm going to say it again, 
they motivate or try to motivate you to leave the Creator and worship and serve some other God. What do you do? What do you do, Israel? What do you do? You don't listen to them. You don't listen to them. That's all I'm looking for you to say. You rebuke them. Don't you know that there is no other powers in the heavens above, on the earth, and the water under the earth, but Yahweh? And don't we know that this source of all power, which is good, righteous, and just, is the creator of everything seen and not seen, and he has an adversarial spiritual entity known as Hashetan, and these two beings are vying for the souls of the human family, and caught in the middle of this epic struggle is Israel. So when the adversarial force, because that's the spirit motivating whoever that person was to give you the sign, whoever the false prophet was, whoever wants you to go back into Christianity, whoever trying to draw you into Islam, whoever is trying to get you into some type of ism or some type of practice other than the scriptures is doing are energized by a satanic force. What do you mean, Prince? Ha Shaitan, the Hebrew word ha, the, Shaitan, adversary. That's an adversarial spirit. And its objective is to draw you away from Yah. What do you do? Yakazio said, what? Reject it. Don't listen to it. Scripture says, submit yourself unto Yahweh. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. You've got to simply resist. And you rebuke. No, I don't serve false gods. What do you mean false gods? You serve Christmas, right? You keep Halloween, right? You start to enunciate all the things that are anti-scriptorial. And then you will be able to successfully, that you are having a spiritual war is going on, is what's happening. You are struggling with powers and principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places. Just as much as the angels of heaven rejoiced over you when you were brought into the knowledge of truth as in the scriptures, then the anti satanic fallen beings called demons are doing everything in their power to draw you back into the darkness. If you did drugs, you were in the darkness. If you slept with other men's wives and husbands, you were in the darkness. If you broke the Shabbat, you were in the darkness. If you didn't keep the high holy days but kept Christmas, New Year's, Valentine's Day, here you go keeping St. Patty's Day, and you're not even an Irishman or Irish woman, but you dressed up in green. If you kept, and here we come, how many of you going to rebuke the fourth that you lie? Because they're going to try to get you to keep it, just like they tried to get you to keep Memorial Day at work. They'll try it. Will you reject it? Will you fall victim to it? Here come Christmas all around again. You working at your various different jobs? Will you succumb and go to the Christmas party to have a little eggnog? Oh, come on, Israel. Talk back to me. Because I know you under pressure. If you are living in this land of the great captivity, I know you are victimized by the ways of the heathen. If you working anybody else's job but your own, will you employ the people? where you are an entrepreneur, where you can take your Shabbats off, where you can do your high holy days, if you are working for anybody in this system, you are subject to the social construct and belief system of the land of the captivities where you live in. And you go through a thing. You be like, oh, man, I'd be glad when these pagan days are over. I know you do. I, know I can hear you saying it without hearing you. Why? Because I used to do the same thing. Man, I can't. Man, here we go. I got to do this Christmas thing again. They're going to put up these doggone Santa Claus hanging from the window. You got all that foolish dog. They're going to put up the doggone hoot owl by my desk. And you sitting there. And one sister, she took all that stuff down. And they fired her. Hmm. Yeah. She didn't care. Because the Creator had delivered her from the darkness. 
How many of us got that type of commitment? I'm not telling you go quit your job, but I'm going to tell you not to practice them days. I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you to keep the Shabbat. And we already said to you, if you don't, if you're not keeping the Shabbat, then let us write a letter for you so you can keep the Shabbat. It's a part of your sovereign Israelite right to keep the Shabbat. And even if you don't want to do it that way, there's a way I know how to write it to where we'll do a Title Seven on them if they don't allow you to keep the Shabbat, then you can have some extra cha-ching-ching in your pocketbook if that's the case. But the serious note is keep the Shabbat. You will not know if you can do what it is you're not doing now because you're afraid to say, I will. Power does not concede except by demand. I will keep the Shabbat. And then you write it down. We draft up a letter for you, and you want to keep the Shabbat. Every letter that we've ever drafted for anybody in regards to them keeping the Shabbat, not one yet, and I give praises unto the Most High, has ever come back with some person at work or the corporation, or the agency that that person worked for say, you can't keep the Shabbat. You just got to know how to do it. Don't go off and quit your job like somebody else I know did, and then they were in a worse condition because they had no income. Creator didn't tell you to do that. You did that. You was listening to the Creator. He would have had you wait till he provided something for you. He don't work like that. Don't put Yahweh, your mighty one, to the test like you did at the waters of Meribah. You listen to the words of Yah. Act out of wisdom, employ time, and then rest in that time. That's called patience. When you rest in that time, you allow time to unfold before you, and then you can see things manifest before you so you will know the right way in which you should go and the good things that you should do. All this was set up this way so we would not listen to false prophets, even if they were to perform miracles. That's in the Torah, right? What's the premise behind that being written in the Torah that way? Let's look at the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 9. There's a reason that's written that way. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 9, and we're going straight into Deuteronomy 14. The Kanji will read straight through Deuteronomy 14 into 15, and we'll close. But in 2 Thessalonica, written to those in Thessalonica, Saul is the writer of this particular epistle. Let me know when you're there, Aki, and if you could read it for us, please. Second Thessalonians 2 and 9. Second Thessalonians 2 and 9, and it reads on this wise. The coming of the lawless one, anti-Hamashiach. Hmm. The coming of the lawless one is according to the works of Ha-Satan, hmm. with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Hallelujah. <laughs> so the lawless one, the son of perdition, is coming, and the lawless one, when he comes, it identifies his attributes or his workings as the workings of the adversary, the workings of Satan. He's going to have with him all power, signs, and lying wonders. Look, the book of Revelation said that the false prophet, the second one, the second beast, the false prophet, will be able to make fire descend out of heaven in the sight of men. Now, if somebody was able to call fire, don't you know that is a power that Yahweh gave unto Eliyahu? When Eliyahu, or, and the power that he gave unto Moses, Moses would call out and the thunder and the lightning fell down and darted upon the earth. Eliyahu called unto Yahweh to shut up the heavens. For three years and six months and it didn't rain? Those are powers that are given to his servants. So the anti-Messiah is going to mimic, duplicate. He is going to replicate some form of prophetic supernatural ability in order to deceive men. Because if you didn't know the truth, and you saw somebody floating down out of the cloud, not looking like you, looking like somebody else on a blue beam, hmm, perhaps you would fall into the lie also. What you mean the lie? Well, we believe the lie that was spun over 500 years ago, that Yahweh was a 
European looking person, you we believe that lie. So if we believe that lie, and that wasn't a lot of hocus pocus smoking lights and mirrors and windows, then what about the lie that's coming? Hmm? You've got the same process that is going on here at this time that we experienced while we were in the wilderness. A purging has to occur. Our people's consciousness has to be raised and the awakening has to be moved to a whole nother level of overstanding because we are still asleep. And so when the, the great deception comes with all these lie wonders and signs, as scripture says, if it was possible, able to fool the very elect, what kind of event yeah. is going to be worked to such a degree that it would possibly fool the very elect? You are the very elect. What kind of thing could be pulled off in grand fashion in order for you to blink your eye at least twice and give a stare and say, hmm, man, 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 oh, is that really the Messiah? Hey, go ahead. Huh? What will happen when you, who haven't seen what those of us have seen that we call the wheels within the wheels, what will you do when you see them? And will they be the right ones that are the righteous ones that you see when they're revealed to you? What would you do if you saw the shape-shifting, multidimensional beings that smell so fierce as I have seen? What would you do? Would you bow down in obeisance to them? Because they claim in the data ones that created the human family. I don't just have the books, but there's tons of documentation on it. Don't you know they've met with these creatures? I'm not talking no spookies, and I'm not trying to frighten you, and I'm not trying to mix up what we're talking about in the scriptures. We're talking about a grand deception. This is the great deception. You've been deceived, deceived before, been lied to by somebody else being Israel, lied to by somebody else being the Messiah. Now the great lie that Satan himself is going to be set up that he is Yah and not Yah at all. And he's coming with great lies and deceptions to possible to deceive the very elect. I'm talking about a grand deception. The scripture says that no marvel Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Don't you know if he appears as the adversary that he is, that you would not be deceived. He's got to come like the serpent did in the beginning to deceive the woman. With a half truth. There's a half truth coming. And some people are going to fall into the deception. And some people will see the emergence of the regenerated, regenerated beast system. And they will do what the scripture says. And all the world wandered after the beast, saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Because the system that they have ready to implement under this new commercial order that they have, the RFID, the biochips, and the magnetic tattoos, it is all in place. Well, then what needs to happen? The next thing that needs to happen is the complete and utter financial collapse of the Western global economic system. So then they can launch the economic system of the new world order. What I'm telling you is old news. We've been waiting for this for a long time, and now everything is in place. So don't fall for the deception. Provisions that you need, you need three to six months' worth of water in your house right now. If you don't have it, you get paid tomorrow. Maybe I'm on a different rotational pay week than you, and you get paid next so-called Friday. You need to take your target down to Walmart, Sam's Club, someplace, get yourself six months supply of water. Don't let it happen. And I done warned you out of love, and you be remembering this tape because something done happened. Get you some water. Get you some dry perishables. You need to prepare for the days of leanness that are forthcoming, not just in America, but upon this world, to test those who dwell upon it. You can see the handwriting on the wall. They're already telling you that they're selected the president, meeting in secret sessions with Hillary Clinton and meeting in secret sessions with Donald Trump, the CIA, 
and the NSA, and neither one of them have received officially the so-called nominations from their respective parties? Or have they already selected the president? Hmm. We'll see. I ain't making no predictions. I'm telling you this to make it simple. Whomever gets in office, we're about to catch hell at a biblical level. That's what's going to happen. Okay. That's what's getting ready to happen. Don't matter who get in there. Don't neither one of them care for you, Israel. So what does it matter who gets in there? You're going to fall into the same old okie doke syndrome of Pharaoh telling that same lie over and over and over and over again with empty promises that don't benefit any of us. It's a shame and a travesty that we sit up and cast our votes for a nation that don't really value us anyway and know how. Take us into 14, Aki, all the way through 14, and then we're going to go back through 15 and close tonight. Okay, and it reads on this wise, You are the children of Yahweh, Eloheaka. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. You are a holy people. You are a holy people to Yahweh Eloheka. And Yahweh has chosen you to be a people for himself. A special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the whole earth. You shall not eat any detestable things. These are animals which you may eat. The ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the mountain goat, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. And you may eat of every animal with cloven hooves, having the hoof split in two parts, and that chews the cud among the animals. Nevertheless, of those that chew the cud or have cloven hooves, you shall not eat, such as these, the camel, the hare, the rock's herex. For, the, for they chew the cud, but do, do not have cloven hooves, for they are unclean for you. And the swine, the pig, <laughs> the swine, the pig, the pork Say it. is unclean for you <laughs> because it has cloven hooves. You do not chew, yet does not chew the cud. You shall not eat their flesh nor... Touch their dead carcass. Hmm. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat all that have fins and scales. Wait a minute, Rager, Rager. Can, so I can I can have I can have uh, shrimp. Fins and scales. I can have lobster. Fins and scales. Crustaceans. Fins and scales. Can, uh, crabs. Crab you may eat all that have fins and scales. One more time. Catfish? Fins and scales. Hallelujah. I think I'm clear now. Fins and scales. All right. Thomas Sheet, continue. And whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean. Yuck. For you. And clean birds you may eat. But mm-hmm. these you shall not eat. You shall- the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the red kite, the falcon, and the kite after its kind, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, and the hawk after their kinds, the little owl, the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the fisher owl, the stork, the heron after its kind, and the hope, the hopi, and the bat. Also, every creeping thing that flies is unclean for you. They shall not be eaten. You may eat all clean birds. You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the, you may give it to the alien who is, in, who is within your gates that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, a heathen, a goyim, for you are a holy people to Yahweh, Eloheokah. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. You shall surely, truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat for Yahweh Elohim in the place he, where he chooses to make his name 
abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of your fo of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks that you may learn to fear Yahweh Elohecha always. But if the journey is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where Yahweh Elohecha chooses to put His name is too far for you, when Yahweh Elohecha has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go to the place which Yahweh Elohecha chooses. And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires. You shall eat there before Yahweh Elohecha, and you shall rejoice. You should you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gate, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. And at the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up in your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion, no inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that Yahweh Elohecha may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn over by. And that is the reading of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14, verse 1 through verse 29. May Yahweh add clarity, enlightenment, and edification to the reading of his word. And so when you look at that, saints, and you see 14 again, it's a reiteration of Leviticus chapter 11 and the dietary code, the majority of it. It's just a little bit more simplified, a little bit more bullet pointed, and it kind of, kind of homes in on you can eat this and you can eat that. And this is the reason you can eat this, and this is the reason you shouldn't eat that. And be specific that this is, again, the reiteration of the larger dietary code that is in Leviticus chapter 11, that a holy people, and that's the emphasis, right? It's a holy people that this is talking to who have a holy diet. Holy people. Kadosh Anashim, holy nation, right? Kadosh I mean, a holy people, that's you, that's separated, set apart, sanctified, consecrated for the service of Yah, different from all the other nations. So you're set apart. And that set apart people have a set apart diet. So we don't eat the things that the other nations eat. They can eat whatever they want to eat. I'm not worried about Susie with the freckles and red hair eating lobster. Susie's not an Israelite. She's not a Hebrew and she does not have a covenant with your fathers. But you, O daughter of Zion, do. And you, O son of Zion, do. I am concerned about what you eat. And being a servant of the Most High myself, if I see you put that on the conveyor belt, I'm going to say something to you. Why? Because I know, and perhaps you don't know, so now let's say you don't know, and I say to you in my conversation that, you know, we as a holy people are instructed not to eat this. And the brother and sister look at you. They're going to either look at you one way surprised and want to hear what you have to say, or they're going to look at you another way surprised and tell you mind your own business. And if they tell you to mind your own business, and maybe they don't say it that way, they might say something like most of our people do ridiculously and say, oh, I've been eating this all my life, and now that they saw that, what do you do? Do you keep pushing the issue? Or do you do what the scripture says? Shake the dust off from your feet as a witness against them, and don't cast your pearls before swine. You ain't got to get no argument. Israelites, they, they, I, I, sometimes I sit and I watch and laugh sometimes at us in disbelief. As much scripture as we read and study it, and we get upset when people don't want to hear, it's because you simply have an expectation. If you don't have an expectation, the expectation that you have is the expectation that you internalize, that you want and would experience yourself. I gave up having that expectation. I simply do what the Creator said. Will you want them for me? They will not hear you sometimes. So don't get upset. Just lead them along. 
shake the dust off your feet. Don't cast your precious pearls, which is the word before swine, lest they turn and run you asunder. So, our brother had a question. Uh, Azaziahu, what's your question, Aki? Shalom. Shalom, Aki. Um, I was actually going to reach out to you last week on this question. Uh, it's concerning the scripture uh, referencing the dietary law. Okay. Um, in chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, um, and I just, I'm asking just to get some more clarity and understanding. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, where verse 15, I believe, mm -hmm. where it says, whatever, only whatever your being desires, you shall slaughter and eat according to the blessings of Yahweh, your Elohim, which he has given you mm -hmm. in all your gates, the unclean and the clean do you eat of. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first read that, I was like, wait a minute. It's saying I can eat unclean stuff. Well, you know, I'm, I'm getting confused. So then I said, well, let, you know, let me read some more stuff to get some clarity. So then when I got to, I believe it's chapter 15, right. verse 21, where um, he's talking about, um, but when there is a defect in it, lame or blind, or has any evil defect, do not slaughter it to Yahweh your Elohim. Mm -hmm. Eat it within your gates, the unclean and the clean alike, as the gazelle and the deer. And then, you know, my, you know, my head started getting like that. You know, those light bulbs that you turn them on, they don't get bright yet. <laughs> and so uh, I'm, I'm still reading it. Then I, when I started getting to the part with the dietary law, then I said, oh, basically the unclean is basically he's talking about the blemishes. That makes it unclean. But it's still when, when it's concerning the clean foods. That's my understanding. I was uh, that it was kind of being revealed to me. And I just want to get clarity on it, make sure I'm not. Um, mm -hmm misinterpreting it or, or, you know, going about it the wrong way. But that's what I was kind of getting, thinking it was saying to me was the, the blemishes mean if it's, of course you can't make anything that's a, that if it's imperfect, you can't make a sacrifice with it. That's true. And that's so when I, okay. So that's what I was wondering um, if that's what it was pertaining to. Cause I was, like I said, I can totally see in chapter 12 verse 15, someone using that to justify them eating shrimp or something. Well, you, you, you're, you're right on point. And then we had this actually happen in 1990 and 1991. It was a brother in the camp. And brother, his brother's in Israel right now. He actually, he lives in Arad. And we had this discussion. This came up right before the High Holy Day. And this brother was saying that uh, you can eat unclean meat. It's right here in the Torah. And I said, well, no, this is not what they're saying in the Torah. So we went and we took these, this is for real, we took these actual two verses, Elder Shadaniah, Elder Raphael, myself, uh, Eliyahu, Ak Israel, Ak Neriyahu, uh, Ak uh, Hoshua, and others who were having this discussion that others were trying to blow, blow up into a debate. And there really was no debate. So let's read these scriptures again so we can come with the right understanding. Verse 15, and I'm glad you brought this up. It says, however, you may slaughter and eat meat within all your gates. So Shiloh, Shechem, Beersheba, Demona, Arad, okay, all the gates in Israel, right? Wherever, whatever your hearts desire. According to the blessings of Yahweh Elohecha, which he has given you. Pause. The unclean and the clean may eat of it. Strike. The unclean what? Person. And the clean person may eat of it. Eat of what? Go back up to the meat. However, you may slaughter and eat meat within all your gates, whatever your hearts desire. So I'm talking about clean meat. According to the blessings of Yahweh Elohecha, which he has given you. Pause. The unclean and the clean may eat of it, of the gazelle and the deer alike. Now, pause. Turn over to 15. 15 that you just brought up. 15 says, and we're looking at verse 22. You may eat it within your gates. Eat what? Let's go to verse 21. But if there is a defect in it, if it is lame or blind or has any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to Yah your God. So 
No sacrifices of anything defected, short leg, long leg, spot or blemish could be sacrificed, right? You still there? King. Okay. But it could be eaten, correct? King. King. All right. So we're on the same page. Let's go forward. It says you may eat it within your gates, plural. Shechem, Arad, Mitzvah Ramon, Beersheba. The unclean and the clean person, there's the key. The unclean and the clean person alike may eat it as if it were a gazelle or a deer. Only you shall not eat the blood. You shall pour it on the ground like water. Hallelujah. Does that help? Aki, does that help? Okay, okay hallelujah. Now, I want to say something to you that, uh, and I know how long you've been studying. I'm not going to reveal that. That's between me, you, and the Creator. But I've seen you grow in the leaps and bounds. We had a discussion with somebody who had been studying this. At that time, we all had been in this way of life for probably about eight, nine years. And it was nothing to do with the scripture. It had to do with ego. And we were like, bro, look past the ego. This is what the word is saying. And so, yes, you are correct. And we want the saints to know that what that meant. It dealt with the unclean and the clean person and that the meat, if it was uh, spotted or defected, or short-legged, you can't sacrifice that. That's like bringing bruised fruit, like what Cain did before the Most High. And he didn't bring his very best. He didn't bring the first lean or rather the first fruit of his offering from the ground, he brought bruised fruit. So doing that with that sacrifice, you'd be bringing some blemished offering before the creator. Now let's move this past the literal from some animals, and let's deal with this on a much higher level of spiritual understanding. You can't come to the Almighty with no corrupt offering, no corrupt prayer. You can't come with no evil in your heart against your brother. You hold in resentment, malice, Hardship, you hold in resentment and a grudge that we want to come before the throne of the Holy One of Israel and ask him to bless us. When we're holding, the Torah teaches, don't think evil in your heart against your brother. So if we have, and we're all human, that's a part of the flaw that's in us, especially after the fall. So we have to work out through the word and through the spirit these bad attitudes and bad behaviors that are keeping us from being blessed. There are impediments. There are spots in our, what, our feast garments, all right? That's my paraphrase to that. There are blemishes in your offering. So you have to come with a pure heart, a broken, humble, and contrite spirit before the Almighty. If you want, if you want him to bless you, then you have to not have the malice in your heart. You have not to have the resentment in your heart. And you can't most certainly think evil against your brother. And we have to remove and purge from us all forms of sin and shortcoming because these are blockages and are impediments to our relationship with our maker. Deuteronomy chapter 15, and then we will take a few questions and we'll close. Because, you know, it's a very short uh, chapter, my brother. Can you read that for us, please? Okay, and it reads on this wise. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts, and this is the form of the release. Every creditor <clears throat> who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor or his brother, because it is called Yahweh's release. Of a foreigner, you may require it, but you shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother, except when there may be no poor among you. For Yahweh will greatly bless you in the land which Yahweh Elohecha is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Only if you carefully obey the voice of Yahweh Elohecha to observe with care all these commandments which I command you today. For Yahweh Elohecha will bless you, you as he promised you, as he promised you, you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many goyim, but they shall not reign over you. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren, 
within any of the gates of your land which Yahweh Elohecha is giving you, you shall not harden your hearts nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever his, he needs. Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to Yahweh against you, and it becomes a sin among you. You shall surely give him, and your heart should be not grieved when you give to him, because... Because for this thing, Yahweh Elohecha will bless you in all your works, in all in all to which you put your hand. For the poor will never cease from the land. Shlika. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. If your brother... A Ibrit Ibri man, a Hebrew man, or a Ibrit woman, a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years. Then in the seventh year, you shall let him go free from you, Laban. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your wine press. From what Yahweh Elohecha has blessed you with, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and Yahweh Elohecha redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. And if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you, because he loves you and your house, since he prospers with you, then you shall take an owl, an awl, and thrust it through his ear, to the door, and, and he shall be your servant forever. And to your female servants, you shall do likewise. It shall not seem hard to you when you send him away free from you. For he has been worth a double hired servant in serving you six years. Then Yahweh, Elohecha, will bless you in all that you do. All the firstborn males that come from your herd and from your flock shall sanct you shall sanctify to Yahweh Elohecha. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You and your household shall eat it before Yahweh Elohecha year by year in the place which Yahweh chooses. But if there is a defect in it, if it is lame or blind, or it has serious defect, you shall not sacrifice to Yahweh Elohecha. You may eat it within your gates. The unclean and the clean person alike may eat, eat it as if it were a gazelle or a deer. Only you shall not eat his blood. You shall pour it out on the ground like water. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Total Reba. Hallelujah. That is the reading of the 15th chapter of the book of the Midbar, Ben Midbar, Devorum. The Barim, rather, and uh, it is verses 1 through verse 23. Total Rabbi, I keep reading for us tonight. May Yahweh add enlightenment and clarity and edification to the reading of his word. So let me pose this question and example to you. So I borrow money from you. And notice I use the word borrow. You lend money to me. How long, let's, let's put a, a dollar amount to it, $10,000. And we create some terms to where this is going to be paid off in seven years. And so now the seventh year cometh. Am I released of that debt? I'm paying it. Sure. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, different scenario. Same dollar amount, $10,000. I've got seven years to pay you back. I'm behind on my payment. In fact, I'm very behind on my payment. 
I'm so far behind on my payment, I've only paid you $5,000 of the $10,000 I owe you. It is the seventh year of release. The year of release has come. I owe you $5,000. It is now the year of release. What do I owe you? Zero. Let it go. Are you sure? Sure. Let it go. Positive. Let it go. Okay. I borrowed money from you. It's $10,000, and I done dipped out of town. Here we go. I owe you. Year one done went by. Year two done went by. Year three done went by. Year four done went by. Year five went by. Year six went by. Year seven. What's year seven? Release. Release. You don't see me till the 10th year, and then all of a sudden, you stand up and talk to somebody else that I owe you money. Is that righteous or wrong? Wrong. Wrong. Why? Release of the debt. So are you telling me even though I owe you money, yet I have not paid you anything, that in the year of release, all debts are canceled out between brethren? Yes. Hey, yes. Cain. Between Israel. All right. So my last two scenarios. So what if I owe you all this money and I haven't paid you in two years? You see me in the third year. <laughs> What you say, Israel? Come on. It's the third year. I have to pay you up or you're going to have to work. <laughs> oh, so wait a minute. So are you telling me that I could actually sell my work time as a servant to you or somebody else to pay off that debt? Okay. 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 So y'all understand that's where you kind of deal just read when you go into the scenario about somebody going into servitude. If your Hebrew brother, man or woman, is sold to you, and then say who sold them, yeah, I can sell myself to you for your services, and I'm going to work for you, and I'm working off this debt I owe you. Okay, how long do I work for you? Maximum. Seven years. All right, but if I love working for you because I've prospered and you've prospered, and I want to be your perpetual servant, no, I did not use the word slave, and Israelite servitude, and yes, we had it, so we got to be real clear on this because the heathen will try to use this against you because that's what part of the New Roots show is about, to, yeah. justify, to justify the chattel slavery that occurred to us. Chattel slavery in America was nothing, let me, put, let me say it this way, slavery or servitude among Israelites was nothing like chattel slavery in America. The maximum period of time that an Israelite would serve another Israelite was seven years unless he or she did exactly this. They would take the awl, go up against the side of a doorpost, and then would have the person either drive it all through the earlobe or have it driven through and become a perpetual servant. But you kept your name, you kept your language, you kept your Yah, you kept the Shabbat, you kept the High Holy Days, you kept your culture. Y'all see the difference? All you did was work off the debt. Very similar to what the Euro Gentiles borrowed and then imposed on their own people when they did indenture servitude. They would only work for a period of seven years to work off the debt. Slavery in America for us was an institution. They intended for our fathers and mothers and grandmothers and you and I to be their perpetual slaves, stripped of all human rights, stripped of your language, stripped of your tongue, stripped of your yacht, stripped of your belief system, stripped of your culture, stripped of your natural mind, and all of that was turned around and you were given a new identity. That's the difference between the two. We did not work the servant. The servant worked off the debt. They worked us from can't see morning to can't see night 
and for 250 years of free slave labor, the Euro-Gentile society of this Western world white supremacist superpower that you call the United States of America became wealthy because she had free Israelite slave labor. That's how she became wealthy. And so when you got somebody, you got 30, 40, 50, 100 people working for you every day for free, and you are the recipient of all of their energized slave energy output, you become wealthy and you create a void with them and a gulf of economic disparity between them and you. Ten times over. To such a degree, yes, that you could never catch up unless you were the recipient of gold, silver, and fine raiment. i got to put it to you in the biblical scenario first because those who are not yet schooled in the spirit and understand history, hearing the word reparations will be hard in your hearing because you think somebody going after money. No, give us the fruit of our labor. You don't work my fathers and my mothers, my grandmothers and grandfathers for you for free. You became wealthy in the richest nation on the planet Earth off of us. The big lie is that we were lazy. Lazy people couldn't have built your country. The big lie is that we were ignorant. Ignorant people couldn't have built your country. You took scientists, astronomers, huh? You took mason builders. You took doctors, dentists. You took the very best that Israel had, and you put the very best that Israel had to work for you for free. And that's how you became so wealthy in such a short period of time, because you cashed in on our labor. So now, at the appointed time, in approximately three years and six months, when it's all been said and done, this creator said, and at that time, I will judge that nation that your seed will serve, and afterwards you'll come out with great substance. The word is rekush, which means that you're going to leave out of here with great possessions. So, yes, you're going to be the recipient of reparations, as it's called in the modern vernacular, or restitution, as it's referred to from a biblical standpoint, meaning you're going to leave up out of here with the spoils of the heathen, just like you left out of Egypt, with the spoils of Egypt, just like you left Babylon, with the spoils of Babylon. It is a repeat performance, only this time you will never have to go back into captivity to anybody else's nation ever, ever again. And so be mindful, saints, that you are going to be the recipient of the possessions of the heathen. So now you ask yourself the question, as we go into Isaiah probably on the Shabbat about the wealth of the heathens. The wealth of the heathens is not spiritual wealth. The wealth of the heathens is material wealth that they have gained from all of the wars and the atrocities and all of the thievery and the extortion that they have perpetuated since and before we came to these shores. So We'll go over a lot of different things that we don't have the time, hallelujah, to go over tonight. But you are living at a great time. We are living at the time that the prophets dreamt of and prophesied that they desired to live in. And we are living at the close of this age and the beginning of the kingdom age. And so we will go over an excerpt on the Shabbat, portions of the book of Deuteronomy that we read tonight. And we will, again, make the announcement very briefly. I will do it myself. Uh, not that no one else can do it, but I'm the one here right now speaking. So for all intents and purposes, we will be taking the sacred visitation to the Holy Land in May and June of 2017. Those who are desiring to go home for this sacred visitation, Please put away for yourself at the end of this month $150 and subsequently another $150 by mid-July, uh, no later than the end of July, so we can secure your seat on the airplane as we travel home. More details will be given about the sacred visitation, the specific dates, all that is included in the package, the 14 different sites that we're going to, your food and your lodging, uh, your travel, and all is included in the entire package. So 
With no further delay, let us turn our attention and direction towards Jerusalem as we come together and close out in prayer. I will truly give thanks unto thee for this assembly and for your word tonight. Total rebuy for our brother who read and those brethren, Ikaziel and Uriahu and Azaziahu who read, sisters and brethren without name but those in spirit who participated in the prayers and blessings of all your saints. I pray that you watch over your people wherever we are scattered throughout the lands of the great captivity, that you would be with us, Abba, as we go out and come in. Grant us success and prosperity in all that we set our hand to do and to watch over our children, all of them, wherever they are, both near and far, and protect them from all danger seen and danger that is unseen. Watch over your people who travel about, Father, on the highways and byways of this country and put your angels of your holy and divine protection around them in their presence to prepare the way in which they must go. I pray thee for all those who are sick and shut in and those who are having difficulty and struggle in their marriages and their household. Bless them and their children, even in their finances, so that they can be the recipients of all the blessing that you have for your people from this day forward and forevermore. So now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be eternally acceptable in thy sight. Yah, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Hokadosh, Hakadosh Israel. Let all of Israel who worship, love, and praise Yahweh say hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
Oh, 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 oh,